So we've been teaching through the Gospel of John over the last while, myself and the others that have been teaching as well. And uh, just a reminder again of uh, what John himself, John the Apostle who writes the Gospel, uh, states as his purpose in writing the Gospel. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, his whole purpose in writing the gospel was just to again demonstrate to people, hey, you know what, Jesus wasn't just a man who lived, he really was the Christ, the Messiah, the one that people had been waiting for. Not only that, but as we put our faith in him, that's where life comes from. Um, and so that's kind of the overall purpose. Uh, but obviously as we, as we speak uh, week to week through different passages, as we go through the gospel, uh, there's different uh, themes that show up. Today we're going to be looking specifically at the whole topic of motivation because that's really what comes out in the passage. And, uh, you know, to begin with, I just want to ask us the question, what motivates you? Of course, that's a huge topic. What motivates you in the job that you have? What motivates you as a student? If you're still a student, what motivates you towards the future in terms of what you anticipate you're moving towards or uh, potential jobs or potentially what you're going to uh, do with your life? What kind of a career is ahead of you? For all of us, what motivates us in the whole area of money and finances? What motivates us as we relate to others? Now, obviously there's lots of uh, answers to these questions and many more questions we could ask. Um, in fact, probably at different times we're not even conscious of what motivates us or doesn't motivate us. Often we're just doing things. And so it actually takes a bit of reflection sometimes to look and say, well, why am I doing these different things? Um, some of us at times, whether we realize it or not, are motivated about, uh, towards being noticed by others. Uh, those of you that ski on the ski hill at different times up at Apex, uh, you probably at different times if you're there early, um, there's a guy who for several years skied in a, or sorry, snowboarded in a uh, suit jacket and tie, not quite a uh, snowmobile attire. Uh, but on top of that, he was a great snowboarder, and so invariably within the second run or so, he was coming straight down the chairs, and so, I don't know, I would think, why are you doing this? Um, well, probably the thing of being noticed by others in some way. Of course, there's all kinds of different motivations that we can have. We can speak about motivations from a negative perspective, uh, wanting status. Uh, doing things so that others will think more highly of us. Uh, wanting to get rich is a motivation for people at various points, thinking that that will bring happiness. Pleasure is a motivation of many people in our culture. Having fun, nothing wrong with having fun, nothing wrong with enjoying things, but as a primary motivation in life, we're really going to end up going down the wrong track. Another motivation for people at different times is to please other people. I put in question marks, is it wrong? Is it wrong to want to please other people? It's a trick question. Yes and no, right? Interesting, uh, because I often hear people say, well, I realize I'm trying to please other people. Well, you know what? The Bible actually commands you to try to please other people. But it tags one thing onto there, for their good. Okay? We're to, we're to aim to please others for their good, for their benefit, for what is, what is uh, helpful for them. But then the Bible equally talks about not pleasing other people for our good to make us look better, <laughs> okay? So uh, I just thought I'd throw that one in there in terms of motivations. But of course we can talk about things from a positive perspective, wanting to please and love God, wanting to do what is best for other people, wanting to see others know and experience God. Obviously we can never go down the wrong path if that's our desire and our attention in terms of why we do things. 
wanting to provide for our family. That's an honorable thing. It's something that God calls us to do. So we could talk about all kinds of stuff in terms of this whole area of, of motivations. I've, I've called my topic today, what drives you? What gets you going? What causes you to make decisions? What causes you to make decisions certain ways? Often, as I've already alluded to, our, our motivations can be more subtle than we sometimes realize. I know myself, I've been caught by surprise when God suddenly shines a light on an area of my life and I thought I had a totally honorable desire and motivation and he goes, oh, see? Whoa, I didn't realize I thought that. <laughs> The passage we're going to be looking at today actually talks about motivations from a positive and a negative perspective, and we see examples of both of those. And so we're going to look at John chapter 3, uh, 22 to 30 initially, and then later on we'll read the rest of the chapter there as well. Uh, but we really see that coming out in our story here. So we're going to read the passage first, and then we'll talk a bit about the story that we see here. So John 3, 22 to 30, reading out of the NIV here. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming out and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison, so he's just setting it in a time frame. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, i.e. the disciples of John, came to John and said, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. So, just a few details of the story, just to, to recount this a bit. Interesting phenomena, because Jesus and his disciples are out in the Judean countryside. They're not in the city. They're not around where the people are. Somehow people have heard they're out there, and people are going where they are. Jesus, obviously, is doing some teaching. But in our story here, one of the main things that's happening is people are going out there to be baptized. So it's not just one or two or three or five or ten or twenty. Loads of people are going out and they're being baptized by Jesus. Same thing's happening uh, with John the Baptist. They're in the general similar vicinity uh, where there's a lot of water there. And, and so Jesus and his disciples are in one location. John and his disciples are in another location. And both of them are continuing to baptize a number of people. And the thing that we see is there's some kind of an argument that develops between a certain Jew, we don't know who the person was, and John's disciples over this whole thing of ceremonial washing. Now, we don't know what that was all about. Did this Jew um, somehow see baptism as a ceremonial thing that you know they needed to go do regularly as some form of being pure? Um, was it about G this Jew having heard that Jesus didn't see baptism just as some ceremonial thing? <laughs> um, uh, did, did he become aware of the differences between Jesus and John the Baptist? And Jesus talks about that himself where, where John the Baptist was much more of an ascetic. Uh, Jesus describes John as he didn't come eating and drinking and Jesus says I did come eating and drinking. Well whatever it was somehow he was very aware of some something to do with ceremonial stuff but what we do know out of this is that some kind of an argument ensued. Okay? And, and uh, uh, the disciples of Jesus go to John out of this argument somehow and they go hey something's going on you know that man you talked about? He's baptizing more people than we are. 
All the people are starting to go to him instead of to us. Until Jesus came along, John the Baptist, in terms of what he was doing, what he was doing was a main attraction. <laughs> Crowds of people, Luke uh, says that in, in his account of the story, crowds of people were continually going out to John. And so somehow, these disciples of John, who interestingly enough, John had already pointed out Jesus and said, hey, there's the one, there's the one I've been talking about. Some of the disciples of John decided to follow Jesus at that point, but others stuck with John. These are ones that stuck with John. And somehow when all the crowds were coming out, when they were a success, <laughs> it was like, oh, this is great, man. Look at all the people coming to us to be baptized. I'm sure they were part of doing the baptizing, all of that. But suddenly when they realized, hey, where'd all the crowds go? Like, how come they're not coming to us anymore? Oh, we hear they're going to Jesus now. Suddenly, the, the affirmation that had been there, the success that had been there, suddenly they're going, oh, this just doesn't feel right. Now, John the Baptist's response was exactly the opposite because he was driven by something else. I told you I'm not the Messiah. <laughs> I told you I'm not the one to come. I told you I'm just the one pointing to him. And, and now that the crowds are going to Jesus, John says, I am so happy. <laughs> I'm like the best man at the wedding. The bridegroom's come, he showed up, and I'm so glad everybody's looking at him now instead of at me. Totally the opposite perspective that his disciples had. And so John, honestly, from his heart, says, you know what? My whole deal here is he needs to become greater and I need to become less and less. And the more I fade out of the picture now and the more he gets into the spotlight, that's exactly that's what's supposed to happen. Now, of course, we'd all like to think that we're much more like John than his disciples. In reality, we probably all have times where we're at least a little bit like the disciples. And so I want to talk about this, this whole thing of, of motivation and um, from, from both perspectives that we're, that we're talking about here. First of all, let me say, let me talk about the temptation to get our strokes from the wrong places. The driving force for various ones of us at different points can be, whether consciously or unconsciously, and like I say, I think often it can almost be on an unconscious level, we're just doing this, but it can actually be, okay, will this give me affirmation? Will this give me something? Um, and that can happen to us in all different areas of life. That can happen in business. When we're on top of the game, it's like, whoa, this feels good, man. There's, there's just an affirmation that comes if you're in business and things are going really well, right? Many of you have been in that place. You're, you're, you, even if you're an employee, you're getting, you know, you're, you're, it's going where you want it to go. You're receiving a good salary. It all feels good until suddenly you lose your job or, or something goes sideways. It can, it can be just having friends and being popular with friends. Those of you that are in school, there's different dynamics that happen there. Any kind of public ministry in the church can also be affirming. And there's a right way in which I believe we should affirm each other. We should encourage each other. But I would suggest that for people like myself, for people that are on stage... There are ways in which it's, a, it's, it's something to be aware of. It's something to be aware of in terms of having our heart in the right place. It's, it's something that's true of, of any kind of leadership in the church or anywhere else for that matter. In terms of making sure that we're doing it out of right heart motives and not out of strokes that we may get in some way out of that. Uh, one, one pastor friend of, me, of mine shared that... Um, he had a number of situations where people were really involved in the church, they became part of the board, but once they were no longer part of the board, they had a hard time continuing to be a healthy part of the church. <laughs> Somehow that transition from being leaders and suddenly not being leaders in that capacity was something they couldn't 
handle in a healthy way. Of course, there's all kinds of applications to this whole thing. The whole thing of, of uh, being able to bless others when they excel, especially in an area where we would like to excel. <laughs> When, when someone gets a great holiday, oh man, I would love to be able to do that, but there's no way I can financially, or whatever it is. This whole thing of where the Bible talks about rejoicing with those who rejoice, and mourning with those who mourn. This whole thing of what, what motivates us, what drives us, what, what brings us to, to doing the things that we do. So, John had completely different response, as we already mentioned, because he was driven by different motivations. So, secondly, let me say joy is fulfilling God's will for our lives. Interesting that for John, it actually meant playing second fiddle. And from the beginning, I think John knew, that's my place. That's what I'm called to do. Not too often that you hear people that are competitive. How many of you have done or do races at different points? Put up your hands. Come on, come on, put up your hands. Some of you race. How many of you, when you're gonna go do a race, I just wanna get second best? <laughs> I don't wanna be first. I just wanna be second or third or fourth. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anybody being interviewed for the Olympics who's kind of up there in terms of their skill level. I'm really aiming for a silver. <laughs> Most or all of us, though in life, at different points, will play second fiddle. In fact, most of us do that in some way. For John, it was never an issue of being second, third, or fourth, or fifth. That was totally out of the picture for him. What was in the picture for him was, what has God called me to do? And he was totally thrilled and happy, whatever that looked like. That's what brought him the greatest joy. Back about... 10, 15 years ago, there just seemed to be this thing happening uh, within, I'm talking the church broader, uh, where various Christian leaders got into a thing called life coaching. And, and I know some people that got into doing that, and, and I'm sure there were various good things that came out of that. But one of the things that I was hearing from them as they talked about what it resulted in was this whole thing of encouraging people towards what have you always really wanted to do? <laughs> and I remember one person being thrilled with, hey, this guy got into drag racing because of the life coaching I was doing with him and he finally is doing what he always wanted to do. And I kind of went, really? Like, is that really what we're about? Obviously, nothing wrong with doing drag racing, or for all of us, we do various things we enjoy doing. My point here simply is this whole thing of greatest fulfillment in life comes from realizing what has God made you for? What is life about? What, what drives you more than anything? Yes, God gives us things to enjoy. I'm not negating any of that. Okay, And we all do those things, and we all should do those things. And when we talk about God's path, God's will, I'd like to suggest at various points that is a fairly wide path. I'm not saying it's always real specific and real detailed for all of us for every part of our lives. But we're asking ourselves the question here this morning, what motivates us overall in life in the middle of doing what we do? What most drives us? Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So the will of God totally applies to how we live day to day. And John certainly got a hold of that. One of the things that, that John demonstrates uh, in, in how he responds is what Jesus talks about, where Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. 
It's interesting, I just, out of interest, Googled, you know, studies on giving. <laughs> and, and people, it always amazes me that people do all these different studies, but they do. Um, they, they've demonstrated, and you, could, you, you can Google it yourself, there's, there's all kinds of, these aren't even Christian studies, these are just secular studies. People are happier when they are regularly giving to others. When they are regularly giving time, energy, money, people, we're just talking generally speaking, it's, it's demonstrated, people are just plain happier as they give, and yet the temptation in life is, I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> and John, in our story, obviously demonstrates he was totally into, no, I just want to give to others. And so when we talk about this whole thing of dry, what drives us, where can you serve others with what God's given you? And I'm not just talking about official ministry stuff, but how can we be people that just give to others and serve others? And Alan Jan are just back, as we already mentioned, uh, from their cruise. Um, and some of you go, yeah, must be nice, you know, uh, go on a four-month cruise. And they thought so too. Um, but you know what I find interesting with them talking to any, those, some of you are in our men's group and Al talked for a while uh, on, on Wednesday morning about, oh, we saw this and this and this and this. You know what came out of his mouth the whole time? All the ways in which they were able to serve other people and, and, and the things they saw God do. Did they see all kinds of neat sights and everything else? Yes, and those are, those are bonus, right? But I just think it's a great example of what, what drives them to do this thing in the first place is we think it's one way we can go and serve other people. And to me it's a great example of how we live life. All of our jobs are part of walking with God. All of our jobs are spiritual. <laughs> Okay? It's what we do in the context of our jobs. It's what we do there in terms of how we come across to other people, how we can serve other people in those contexts. I really like what, what John uh, the Baptist said here uh, in verse 27. You can only receive what's given you from heaven. Uh, talking about this whole thing of motivation. And... Um, he said it in response to his disciples coming to him and saying, hey, they're all going to Jesus. How come they're not with us anymore? And his response is, you can only receive what's given you from heaven. In other words, there is a sovereign element to what we end up doing in life, or to put it another way, what we're wired for, there's a sovereign way in which God has done that for every one of us. You know, we, I, I sometimes hear people say, you can do anything you want in life. I go, really? <laughs> there's a way in which God wired every one of us for certain things and to me, that's a huge promise. John wasn't stating this as a negative thing. To him, the whole thing that was happening was positive. This is the way it was supposed to be. He got to do all the stuff to announce Jesus coming. And now it was at the stage where he needed to fade in the background. Jesus needed to get in the spotlight. And he says, you know what? You can only receive what's been given you from heaven. And, and to me, it's, it's a huge comfort. Some people have talked about this as staying in your lane. In other words, there's something really good about all of us realizing this is how God has made me. This is the gifting he's given me. This is the abilities he's given me. For me to try to be someone else, I'm actually fighting against what God's made me for. But the more we can recognize this is how I'm wired, this is the stage of life I'm in, some of you are older. Some of you, you know, you go, well, I can't do all kinds of stuff anymore. Well, your lane right now is at the stage that you are, and there's a right way in which all of us need to be in that lane right now. Yota has come to me uh, on more than one occasion and says, I can't do everything anymore. <laughs> no, you can't. But you can do what you can do right now. 
And that's your lane right now. That's the place God has you in right now. And that's the right place. And there's a way in which we all need to embrace where we are. And I'm not talking about becoming passive and going, okay, well, I'll just sit back and not try to do anything. No, no. In terms of how God has made all of us, John the Baptist totally stepped into everything that he was made for, everything that he was meant to be, and he went for it with all that he had, and he knew when it was time to be in front of the crowds, and he knew when it was time to step back. Eleanor Mumford, uh, she and her husband uh, are from the UK. They're kind of overseeing Vineyard International now in some ways. Uh, but she made this statement, don't try to be someone else. They're already taken. <laughs> God's called all of us Every one of us, every one of us in this room is different. Every one of us, God's given us certain abilities, certain gifts, certain callings. And there's something wonderful when we go, okay, that's who I am. I can embrace who I am, and whatever that looks like, I can embrace that. Whatever it looks like in this stage of life, I can embrace that. And I can be what God has called me to be in the middle of that. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes 5.19 that talks about it being a gift of God to be able to accept our lot in life. And again, this is not a, this is not a passive stance, Okay. But there's a way in which all of us need to embrace this is where I am right now. And how can I function as God's called me to be right now where I am? Uh, another verse along these lines, Psalm uh, 16, verse 6. Uh, David says, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And the analogy, of course, is, you know, in, in those days, um, they didn't have uh, property pins like we have, but they just set up rocks. Okay, this is my property, and, and there's a way in which properties got divided up and all that stuff. Okay, so he says, the boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. Man, am I blessed. <laughs> look, at, look at what God's given to me. Am I ever blessed? And there's a way in which for every one of us, whatever that looks like for us, where we are, as, as we embrace that, there's something powerful about that. And then the last thing that, that grows out of the, the next verses we're going to read, Jesus really is the ultimate greatest motivation. So let's read the, the following verses, uh, John 3, 31 to 36. So now this is uh, John the Apostle's commentary. Okay, he just told the story. Now these are the things that he says in response to that. The one who comes from above, I'm talking about Jesus, okay? The one who comes from above is above all. The one who's from the earth, I'm talking about John the Baptist, belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives his spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever, whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So let me just go through this really quick. In, he's, he's making a contrast between John the Baptist and Jesus. Okay? And so um, in terms of John the Baptist or any of us, I think we could say the same things about us. He says, he says you know what? Actually, John the Baptist's perspective, he was told, he's not saying this negatively. He's just, he's just given perspective. He says he belonged to the earth. He, he, he did things that he saw from this perspective. Uh, he speaks as one from the earth. In other words, a limited perspective. We only know what we've seen and experienced. Okay? He's, he's saying that, that limited perspective. Conversely, he talks about Jesus. And he says, Jesus is from heaven. I mean, he, he's not just speaking from down here. He actually came down from up there. And everything he speaks, he knows from up there. <laughs> He speaks as one who has seen and heard things from heaven. He speaks the very words of God. 
God has given his spirit to him without limit. He says, Father, the Father loves the Son, has placed everything in his hands, all authority. To reject him is to reject God. Believe in the Son, as, as Mark already referred to in his prayer earlier on, believe in Jesus. You start life, eternal life, and eternal life, whenever it talks about the Bible, it's not talking about then, sometime, it's talking about what starts now. Okay? Reject the Son, no life at all. In other words, what he's underscoring here is, is John the Baptist in this story, he got it. To listen to Jesus, he goes, no, no, Jesus is not just somebody. Jesus is the one who has absolutely all authority. Whatever Jesus speaks is truth. Whatever Jesus speaks, he speaks with total authority. And that totally governed everything that he did. To live life by any other motivation than what God says is actually to be deceived. <laughs> because Jesus is the only giver of life. One commentator about this says, the stakes are really high in this game. <laughs> Believe Jesus, follow Jesus, go by what Jesus says, eternal life. Go by what you want to do in your own way of life, guess what? No life. And in fact, he says, the wrath of God remains on such a person. In other words, what he's saying is, our sin separated us from God. We're already in that place without Jesus, okay? We already don't experience that life that Jesus came to bring. Jesus came to do something about it. If we don't embrace Jesus, we just stay there. And so, um, I just wanted to call us again. I believe the scripture calls us again to this whole thing of um, just a reminder. Obviously, the vast majority of you here this morning are in a place where you said, yeah, I, I want to go the Jesus way. <laughs> I want to do things his way. And sometimes God shines his light on us and goes, uh, why are you doing this? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but as we continue to respond to that, that's life. That's where we get purpose. That's where we, as we continually go, hey, you know what? It actually is more blessed to give than to receive. It's actually more blessed to live a life of how can I serve others? How can I do things for others? That actually brings life. John the Baptist believed that to the point of being ready to be executed, and he was. But he knew that was actually the path to life. Which from our human perspective, we go, really? It got you killed. But John realized, no, no, that's real life. <laughs> and so I just want to call us again this morning to this whole thing of continually, I'm not talking about some kind of an anxious, oh, am I doing this from the right perspective? No, but continually in our lives to keep going back to that place, okay, God, I, I want to let your motivations actually govern what I do day to day. And there might be some of you here this morning where you realize, hey, you know what? I don't live life that way. I, I, don't, I don't let him govern me continually. Uh, in fact, I haven't even been at the place of believing in him. And if you want to come and talk to some of us here this morning, either up front or uh, if you want to talk to whoever brought you, if someone brought you and just talk about what does that look like? Um, the, the promise here is that's where life comes from. That's where eternal life comes from. Life in this life, but also life in the life to come. Why don't we have the worship team come up, and um, we're gonna we're gonna end with a song here. Let's stand together. Any words from any of you, prophetic words or things that God spoke to you that especially in line with what God's been saying here this morning?
So Lord, we ask you to just shine your light on us. Thank you that you don't do that to condemn us. We thank you that your light actually brings life. And wherever you want to shine your light and just reveal something to us, Lord, if, if any of us have been just veering off onto a wrong path, Lord, I pray that you would just shine your light on there. And Lord, I pray for the ways in which different ones here just need to hear your voice where, where you're just wanting to say, yeah, you are going down the right path. I feel like God just wants to speak words of affirmation to various ones of you this morning. Just hear that from him. Some of you need to hear that the ways that you've been aiming to give yourself out of love for others, God just wants to speak to you to say, that's what brings life. And so, Lord, as people have been doing that, I pray for your refreshing. I pray for the, just the evidence of your life. And Lord, I pray for, for us, for various ones of us, on our jobs. Uh, I, I pray for just a, a renewed sense of what the very things we've been talking about here today, what that can look like on our jobs. For those who are students in school, Lord, I pray for uh, just the eyes to see what that can look like. And for some of you here this morning, I feel like God just wants to give you a green light where you've been seeking God on something and he just wants to say, yep, just go that way. You're, you're, you're aiming to go my way. Just keep going. Let me just uh, open it up again this morning. If any of you would like prayer um, following the song, if you'd like to come up for prayer, if you want to grab somebody, uh, we'd love to pray for you uh, related to the things we talked about, but also if there are other things that you've come with today, you'd love to have someone pray for you. Uh, we'd love to do that. Let's uh, do a song together.